Welcome to Inside the House podcast, episode number eight. Again, at Virtual Worlds. Hope you enjoyed the last one. Um, it was a little bit different discussion. We enjoyed ourselves there, and you'll see from the video we put on YouTube of us actually using the 4D um, experience. This particular episode, we've got a slightly different group of the panel discussing more about bathroom industry and also virtual worlds and how they've come to be the leading uh, software in bathroom design. You'll find some of the things they've tried, some of the things that haven't worked. So this is again very interesting. Different set of the team here and uh, Ben Roberts, who's the national sales manager. Uh, and you've also got Nathan, the managing director of Virtual Worlds Logicom. So I hope you enjoy this one. Again, follow us on social media, follow us on the website and uh, YouTube, like the videos and uh, catch up soon. Thank you for being here today uh, at Virtual Worlds. Um, just today we've got uh, Ben, Nathan, Jamie and Murray. Make sure we've got the names right in the right order. Um, That's all good. Yeah, it's all good. So just quickly, just want to get a, a quick overview of yourself, uh, Ben, where you sort of, what do you want to be when you was younger and then where, how you ended up in, in this career? I suppose I wanted to be an actor, mm -hmm. so I suppose today I've made it. Yeah, you are. You are there. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Um, my mine's actually quite a short story because I'm I'm basically a one company man. So if you want to go back a bit further, I was a kitchen porter, mm -hmm. um, and then I worked for McDonald's for a couple of years. Um, I went to I was actually I was a national employee of the quarter at McDonald's. No. So that was uh, like won me a lot of yeah. Um, yeah. gift. Have you got a certificate <laughs> up in your office? I've got, I've got all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, I've got loads of he's, photos. He's photocopied them all over the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they are everywhere. Um, and then uh, I did a few years at uni doing uh, management studies in Sheffield. Um, after that, I mean, that was pretty much all about McDonald's as well. So. But what did you want to be when you were younger? When you when you were 12, 13, 14, what did you want to be? Did you want to be a fireman? I or just an actor. actor? I, I was I was um, I was runner up in the Milky Bar Kid oh, when you? I was like six years old, so oh. that was my thing. So you were definitely <laughs> going to be destined for. I was it. destined to be an actor, and then I think I got a bit bored with it. It all seemed to be at school. It all seemed to be sort of very dance led and uh, movement led, and you know I was a I was a big lumbering centre back as a footballer, so I couldn't get one leg over another when it when I was asked to <laughs> dance. So um, I sort of chopped it short, and then um, a few years later. Basically, um, after I'd sort of um, finished trying to become a football coach and mm -hmm. went over to the States and things after uni, um, I'd heard about this company, Logicom, been to all the big Logicom family barbecues because my dad was um, was lead programmer of Virtual Words when it first started. I um, eventually sort of said, all right, I'm going to have to get a real job. And uh, there was an opening as a, an area sales manager, so mm -hmm. I joined. Yeah, superb. Never Excellent. Looked back. Yeah. And how long have you been here now? This is year 11, so oh, yeah, I, um, 11 years in December. Oh, very good, very good. Um, and yourself, Nathan? Hi. Um, well, as a kid, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to be. I was very, very confused. Um, I know what mum wanted me to be. She wanted me to be a pianist really? or a doctor. Um, and I became a plumber. Oh, really? um, <laughs> <laughs> much to my mum's disappointment at the time, I think. But um, that, that came about from... That stressful time at school when you've got to make a decision, and I just had no idea. I really, I really didn't. I didn't really take to school work at all. Um, and the best advice I got at school was leave when you're 15 before the smart people hit the market. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was it. But actually, that was really good for me. I think so, my dad did the same, to be yeah, fair. Yeah. yeah. And um, on leaving school, that's when I really started to excel at college, mm -hmm. um, doing something I was really interested in. So I understood the practicality and what it's working towards. Um, yeah, and that's been me really at age of 15 in the KVB industry, yep. uh, doing plumbing, set up my own company eventually uh, when I was 19, um, moved to New Zealand, started up another company and sold that, went on to bathroom showroom, became an importer and supplying showrooms as well at the same time, and then software. And that's what I'm doing today, heading this team. And yep. it's a fantastic position to be in. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, really leading the industry in, in where we're specialising. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, one thing was actually interesting feedback for yourself as well, we were chatting to the guys earlier, and they said that the culture here is very much a fun culture. Yeah, it's a family it's, fun culture. I think it's it, really important. Um, that there's times when, out of a good situation, it gets stressful because we're so busy, and that's a good stress to have. Yep. And it's great how the team will rally around each other 
And of course, when stress gets to a certain level, the best way of sorting that is a good good laugh at something or another. Yeah. But we've all we're all having a laugh, aren't we? But we're very professional at the same time, so we have the laughter. Yeah. But when it comes down to business, you know, we're we're very professional. Yeah, the guys were saying earlier that you know that they tend to get a good vibe and a good mix within their little teams. Yeah. Of a, it's a nice little culture, and they said it comes from the top sort of down. So right. it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite That's good. good. I think <laughs> what's interesting about that as well is that the last few years, as we've sort of started to move into virtual reality side of things, and we we sort of very aware of the fun nature of the technology that we're using. And we've tried to incorporate a bit of showmanship, haven't we, into the yeah. things that we do. So, mm -hmm. for example, when we were looking at the KBB show last year, we were thinking we're, well, we're going to be presenting live to big groups of people and we've got to try and engage them. So a lot of what we were doing in preparation was trying to think about you know, how you talk to an audience and how you get audience participation. And we worked through all sorts yeah. of little rituals and routines, didn't we? Most of which, on the day, we abandoned. <laughs> yeah. But we had all sorts Sorry. of props. Isn't, wouldn't it be quite good to, like, when you're doing a demo, open the fridge and there's Superman stood inside it or something like that? <laughs> you know? They're the sort of things that, that get people a bit of a laugh and engage and break the barrier, isn't it? It's that yeah, we're going to do those things. Heavy, I'm sure you have. Games as well. Yeah, game yeah, games. Yeah. 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 And Jamie, the same for yourself. Um, yeah, um, I left school uh, after my A-levels. So I was uh, 18. I've done a couple of... Months actually at McDonald's, not quite as long a stint as, as Ben did. Did obviously. you get any certificates? That's no, the question. That, that's oh, the main wow. reason I was there for a month. Didn't get any uh, certifications, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so we left. Um, but um, I mean, when, when I was uh, much younger, I wanted to be a Formula One driver. That was that was my uh, aim. And that is very high expectation, but I didn't quite get there. Um, but no, I, I left and actually stumbled into working with um, with my dad, who owns an engineering company here in Northampton. Um, and the idea there was to sort of save up and, and go to uni, but I didn't actually go in the end. I decided that I wanted to try and make a go of it without uni and, and just worked up, up the ladder in a, as a career. And I stayed at my dad's for a little while, um, but my interest was always in the IT side more than uh, the probably hands-on side. And then, um, yeah, opportunity came up here. I had my interview with Nathan here, who, um, remember the phone call, he said to me, <laughs> said to me, I'm going to give you a shot this time, so make it count. <laughs> um, uh, but um, it, it went, the interview went well, I feel, and Nathan, I think, are the yeah, same. Definitely. And then yeah. we, we You're still started. Here. Still here, and that was yeah. seven yeah. years ago. Wow, well, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. You stand out. Yeah, <laughs> so I've been uh, over there a bit traveling in Australia and things like that in, in yeah. the time. Boomerang Jamie. But yeah, yeah the. the um, gone and come back again. Has he? Yeah, uh, yeah the, the guys here. Uh, sort of what you said a moment ago about um, this sort of family environment. One thing I'll say is. With, with Nathan uh, and, and the team, really good at, you know, I wanted to do something different and get some experience of travelling under my belt. And, yeah, and they basically said, go go and come back when you're ready, and that's what I did. So, yeah, yeah very good. And then very commendable still here. Yeah. Business. But that's, a, that's, that's good for experience, out. and hopefully you come back stronger and better and you've learned yeah. and evolved anyway. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. as, as a person, so you bring other things. You may have seen other things from different industries. And yeah. that's always... Um, I think you even got roped into some training in Australia while you were over there, didn't you? Um, I, th I think there was a talks about it might happening, but then... Oh, we didn't we, manage to it, tie it, you down. No, nobody... Yeah. Even. And he was missing us too much. He was desperate yeah, to get back. <laughs> yeah. He didn't back. have a mouse in his backpack. <laughs> no. No. And, and then Murray, the same for you. Um, yeah, when, when I was younger, I was going to play in the NBA. That yeah? My, yeah, <laughs> cool. absolutely. Did you really? Yeah, yeah, I was, but I was too short, too yeah. slow, and just not very good. Too so <laughs> not very good. <laughs> didn't really... It wasn't going anywhere. So... Um, yeah, I went to university to do computer science mm -hmm. because that's what I was good at at yep. school. And I thought, hey, you know, um, left that, got some jobs around here. But like like Ben, I also have a family connection in that my father is the founder of the company. Yep. So um, about seven years ago, he said, we've got a slot opening up. We need a, we need a programmer. And I think you, you'd be a good fit for the job. Yep. So... Here I am. Yeah. And he was right. Yeah, yeah. he was right. I like yeah. to think so. And yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Cool. That's really good. D so just uh, to dive into the, the, the product then. So what makes, in, in your guys' opinion, I'm open to the floor already, but what makes your product the best in the class you know, com compared to the competition? That's always an interesting one when I speak to brands and manufacturers. Yeah. How do you feel that? Well, from my perspective, it's the fact that we 
sort of brainstorm and create, develop um, solutions for the KBB industry in-house. So we understand the sector and it's about identifying problems and bringing about solutions. So, you know, th there's other companies where they buy in technology. I think there's something different where you're at the very beginning of its inception, you know, the whole thought process and seeing that development continue in something that you believe in. Yeah. So. And you also understand it better if you do that, no? Mm. I mean, yeah, if, you just, if you just yeah. take something on um. <laughs> or inherit a bit of software or yeah. whatever it may be, you, you're good owning, with it. Yeah, so owning it, being your baby, it's something you're really passionate about and that you yeah. believe in. Yeah. And there's the difference about bringing something to market that you absolutely believe in. You know why it's been created, you know what job it's going to do, and yeah, starting that way, it's going to be very successful. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, yeah. You, you were a a user, weren't you, of the, the yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah, software like initially? That's yeah. how you, so I, so I started off by buying, buying the software, and I can't remember what year it was, but I remember... Um, Did Ben search it? <laughs> <laughs> no, he wouldn't be here. Yeah, <laughs> he wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> no, I, I was in New Zealand, and I was looking for some CAD software, because I used to do everything by hand drawings, my team did as well. And... Um, I actually went ahead with a program. I had a 28-day money-back guarantee. And on day 27, I sent it back because somebody told me about Virtual Worlds. One of the it was actually the ideal standard um, importer in New Zealand, and I saw this program, and it, I remember how I felt when I saw it. I was just amazed. Um, I saw this program at a time when all software was doing wireframe, mm -hmm. um, crunching the image down to produce some sort of perspective, coloured drawing. It took ages. And Virtual World was doing this in real time, opening and closing doors. And I just felt like somebody had travelled to the future, found this programme and brought it back to me. So, um, yeah, I was in awe of it. It was really remarkable. And it became um, one of the yeah, key components of my business that helped it, it grow. So I believe it from within, having made the investment and, and sought benefit my business. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes a point of difference, doesn't it? You know, cause Every business has got a similar goal in in many ways from a bathroom sharing perspective, you know, to try and sell the product to a consumer and, and make some money at the same time. Um, but if you can give that added value, or you can, because a lot of people struggle to understand what it's going to look like. Yeah. You know, you doing it every day, you go, yeah, I can position that toilet there, I can position this shower here, and then you, I, I can visualize it in my head roughly how it's going to look. Yeah. Um, whereas a consumer, because they're not used to it, they'll struggle with that. And I think that's the, the, the value of the product. Yeah, so the key thing is having the same image in the designer's mind and in the customer's mind. Yeah. And it's amazing, even when you've got um, sometimes um, rendered images even, that still there could be a bit of misinterpretation of the space. Yeah. So, you know, hence 4D technology, 4D theatre. Mm -hmm. It eliminates any misinterpretation completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good point. I think it's like you said. You know, and the communication is what we see our our jobs mm -hmm. as. We we want to make sure that you know, for most people, when they're buying a kitchen in a bathroom, it, it happens once in their lives, doesn't it? And obviously, from us being in the industry, um, and most of the people listening to this podcast as well, you'll know that um, that you guys have an understanding of things because you do it day in day out. Whereas, like you say, a consumer, they, they walk into a, a showroom, they probably um, see some products online and they're looking for inspiration there, and they probably get some ideas from other people's houses. But that's basically their grounding in the industry, and they have to become experts very quickly. Um, so our job is to make it as easy for them as possible to understand, which makes you know, retailers find, um, find it a, a lot easier process to just get across what they're trying to uh, imagine trying to explain to the customer and also things like working out the impracticalities of what might be really passionate uh, consumer ideas but it's you know I want this sort of thing and then you know the people in the industry who actually understand it they need a way of explaining to them why that won't work and, and what a better way of doing it would be. Letting the customer down gently and shattering their yeah, dreams. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> by showing them in real time that it's not going to work. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. I do have a better option for you yeah. at my sleeve. Of course, yeah. I think um, you know, one thing that w makes us stand out and something that we've, we've always been very proud of is, is the fact that you can visualise those changes in the 3D or whatever, where some of the other systems are, have been pro primarily 2D. So coming back to what the guy said here, it's, it's about making sure that the, the end consumer who 
can't visualise a 2D uh, symbol of a unit and the finish on it is, is presented with it without any question of what it's going to look like. Um, you know, and, and from my side, in terms of used to come back to communication, I think um, something that we might do slightly differently is the communication internally between, say, the, the support and training department and, and the development team really, and back yeah. up to, to Nathan as well, is it, it's not, there's no divide internally of, um, you know, the, the development is... It's sort of moulded by yeah, yeah. by the user feedback, and that's how we always try and do it. Definitely, I was going to touch on that with yourself, Jamie. Is that when you get the feedback from the customer, because obviously you know customers may be phoning up trying to do a challenging mm -hmm. um, concept. I remember when I've used virtual worlds many years ago, and, and one of the, the biggest challenges we used to have, and it's probably a lot better today, is that is cut roofs with shower doors uh, and mm -hmm. showers enclosures. So trying to cut a uh, shower door into a roof was actually quite challenging mm -hmm. on some of the early parts of the software many many years ago. Uh, and that was quite difficult to represent to a consumer. And also putting a model inside there to say, this is your headroom you've got left. And the consumer, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. You, know, you, you won't. You'll be ducking down like this. And you yeah. no, you can't have a fixed head. It's not going to fit. Yeah. You know, if I want a fixed head, but it's not going to work in your roof space, you know, um, and trying to visualise that. But when you get those challenges with consumers, um, so customers of yours trying to uh, make the customers, their customers rea into reality, how do you feed that back to the team? Well, how does that work? One thing that we've done, uh, we've now got a lot more avenues of people giving us feedback so you know now we've introduced things that people can right click on a unit and tell us about either a potential problem with it or a, you know even a request for for something new um, we also capitalize on you know any calls that we get through the line we, we always log them into sort of tickets and then we'll do analysis on where the most uh, questions are asked in what parts of the system so be it tiling or cutting or something like that mm -hmm. and then we try and use that analysis based on general you know, almost general feeling in the department as well. You, you know, you, you get an idea of what a lot of the questions are that are asked because you're answering them, you know, <laughs> all yeah. the time. So they're developments or areas that we, we you know, we'd sit down and, and look at how we're going to improve in that section. And, come, you know, we said about the cutting there, you know, we've, in, in the last couple yep. of years now, we've revamped how the cutting works completely. It used to be you have to go to different menus, and depending yeah. on what order you did things <coughs> That's in. That's correct, yeah. Results. One out in front of the other. Yeah, and you don't. Yeah. I'd always get it wrong. Yeah. Cut the unit yeah. out in front of the basin. Yeah, we used to get it wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can never um, still remember. You have to put the basin so, in and the unit, and then yeah. cut the yeah, yeah, the no. basin. <laughs> and, and now, you know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter. You, you just right-click, cut, and then it does what it's supposed to do. And and those sort of things, yeah, we we try and capitalise on any of the feedback we do get. Um, even if it's, you know, we have we have had times um, where it's just a, it is a single user that is struggling with something that maybe not many people do a lot, and you know, even then, in in the you know fairly short period, we've we've put a change in or uh, you know to make it easier. It we don't necessarily we do it on you know number of, of of calls in a particular topic, but also sometimes you just get something that a new user has uh, come for training for the first time, mm. and they just happen to say that seems a little bit. Uh, not as intuitive as it could be and yeah. you know we're looking at it from a perspective we we do it every day you yeah. get used to some of the things that we we do every day and then you just think actually you're you're right that we could just add that extra messaging or something yeah. and make things a lot easier i think so. that happens quite a lot doesn't it people using yeah. it for the first time mm -hmm. just pick up on things that the rest of us are just yeah i mean we're almost blind yeah. to because yeah. we're just, just so accepted. used to the system yeah. yeah and, and i'm regularly if I'm, if I'm training anybody i'm regularly making notes of sometimes mm. even even you find things when you're training things and you think actually we could probably do that a slightly different way yeah. um or it know, moves on just to review it and being able to do that because we've made a series of other changes that mm. are disconnected yeah. to the this now is an open possibility. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Whereas we were blind to it before, because yeah. you wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do that before. No. Well, it's an evolution um, of the software, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. Exactly. At one point you couldn't do it, but now we've made yeah. these changes. Now yeah. actually, that's quite a simple change now to make yeah. everyone's life easier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I've always been a firm believer: if you had never used a computer before and you went to a Mac or a PC for the first time, this is me. I think a Mac would be easier to use. I personally think it's more intuitive from the first get-go. If you never used one before. But then if you have used Mac or PC, I don't know if you've used the two, but the, the, the mouse um, location for closing windows in different places, all that sort of little things, yeah. them little changes, but I think they're more intuitive the other way. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it's only intuitive if you've got no, you know, no yeah. basis for and that's what I'm saying for you. Yeah, so if you guys, someone's using it all the time, they'd know that to right click, but if someone says, oh, I think I just double tap on there, you know, okay, yeah. well, we yeah. can make that double tap, yeah. and, you know, make it easier for you. So. Yeah, well, we've done that. I mean, we used to have... Um, uh, back in the early days of virtual worlds, you used to have different tools. But if you wanted to open and close a door, you have to go to a different tool and do that. And now you can double click on it, and it you know it does the same thing. So, we've we've certainly done that over the, the 
the years is just improve those things as well. That's good. Yeah, it's important for us to connect with our customers and you know, get some information. So the other method that we have is the road shows that we do. So mm -hmm. we've done a series of road shows over a couple of years, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic, you know, be able to listen to people as we do the training exercises sometimes at the road show. Yep. So we're getting feedback then as well but also able to ask our customers what's important for them in the future, what changes would they like to see. Yeah. Um, with our one price <coughs> development, what would they like to see it do next? Yeah, That's, uh, that was actually yeah. one of the next questions, is where's it gonna go? So I, I, th I would say that you guys are probably one of the, if not the lead in the industry yeah. with the likes of augmented reality and 4D and taking it, but so if we just cover that before we go on past that for a second, but so with 4D, how do you how do you guys as a business see that evolving the kitchen and the bathroom retail showroom as it is today and yeah. someone adopts that where where is that so we we'll, we'll see it becoming an absolute industry standard mm -hmm. everyone is going to have vr yep. it's the try before you buy it's you're asking people to make a big investment in the most expensive rooms in the the home um, they're not going to want to leave anything to chance and as vr becomes more um, people are more aware of it and they understand the benefits that it's providing, um, it's the only acceptable way of buying these rooms. So in the short term, we're going to see um, VR become more more realistic. So the audio-visual aspects of it becoming more crisp. Um, we're already a long way with all the reflective qualities that we've got in, in 4D theatre. Um, materials like linen and leather, they all look very realistic. Um, I think next stages, I mean, we're already experimenting with haptics. That's where you're using force feedback to feel surfaces. Yep. Um, and then beyond that, we're looking at the actual technology for linking multiple physical spaces to conversion one virtual space. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am losing my, my voice. Don't uh, worry, it's fine. I've got this head cold. Um, so we're very interested to see where this development of having multiple physical spaces linked in one virtual space opens up new business opportunities for all of our customers. Because well, as I said, one thing I was going to say with that, with showrooms today, I think they, they, they've always done too much of what they've always done, yeah. and they're not uh, changing enough. And I yeah. think that's the failing of the high street that we're seeing in retail today. And, and if they're not careful, my belief is they're, they're going to get left behind yeah, big time. Absolutely. And, and I like the comment that it's going to be a staple part of any kitchen, bathroom, showroom, mm -hmm. 4D theatre. But surely, to me, that's a benefit to them as well. That's what I can't work out. To me, surely it's a benefit, because you might have three or four physical displays. Uh, you know, big show might have 20, 30 displays. But you don't need 20 or 30 displays now, because you might have three or four to show the brand off and show the product. And then what you can actually do is, is, is sell off the back of that. Because we all know from a showroom, I'm sure, if, if a showroom experience, that, you know, you, you put something on, you won't sell that one. There'll yeah. be something off the back of it. So if you show a nice one, uh, show some different textures and products, and then use the 4D to sell it, whatever the consumer physically wants, or yeah. what's best for them. Mm -hmm. So when, when we launched about four years ago, that was sort of a big, that was the big turning point for us in terms of developing virtual reality. We've been waiting for the hardware to, uh, to catch up and become available and there were two big um, companies that started to drive the hardware side. It was HTC mm -hmm. and uh, Oculus Rift, who Facebook now own, uh, and spent two billion to buy and then another two billion on legal fees because uh, it was developed on another company's time. So we knew they were investing big in the industry and we've just been waiting for the right platform. Um, because Virtuals has always been virtual reality software, but it's been, you've had to look at it through a desktop. Yeah. And what the technology evolution gave us the opportunity to do was say, now we've got the medium by which you can actually become part of the design and bring the customer into their design, which was a huge difference in the process. But what showrooms were saying to us when we first launched was, I and mean, thank you because the industry has been looking for something different and we need a way to market ourselves. We hear a lot of, you know, a lot of people, and you mentioned before um, about people um, feeling the threat of online sales. The benefit that we see to these guys in, in, uh, in retail showrooms is to be able to give the customer a reason to come in store and, mm. and have an in-store experience. Yep. So 
for it, even at that stage when we were first launching the technology, the, cons- the, the retailer benefit was we've got something different we can offer. But as Nathan's saying, the actual practical side of 4D is that you know, people may, and people listening to this podcast will, I'm sure, think this, you may think there is a, a gimmicky side to using technology in this way. And when we talk about virtual reality in 4D, um, people who haven't experienced it will often think, yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, fine. You can use that if you want. Um, it's not It's not for us. So easy to dismiss. Easy <coughs> to dismiss, Well, we always yeah. do it how we've always done it. Exactly, oh, yeah, do yeah. it. Exactly. It works for us now, yeah, yeah. yeah. It works for us now. I can, oh, the fir- in fact, the first things I used to get when I was first selling software are, uh, I can sell bathrooms off the yeah. back of a fag packet. I don't need <laughs> software to sell. Mm-hmm. Now, you might not need software to sell, but what we're trying to do is help you sell more. And the big part about virtual reality is the moment you put the headset on and you experience our 4D, you completely get it because now you're you can put yourself in the customer's shoes and you can think mm. yeah i would be mad to buy off plans and pictures if i actually had the chance to to go and explore it before in, i buy it in the same way you wouldn't buy a family home without having first gone to the space yeah. to view it can you imagine being sat down at a computer to buy a family home and you're you're being told how many electrical points there's going to be in the lounge how high the ceiling's going to be it's a lot of information um, over, overkill where it's going to go over the top of the customer's head. Um, buying a car where you've been shown, well, this is the steering wheel over here and the seats are over here, and here's a sketch of what the car will look like. You're just going to feel a bit uncomfortable about are you visualizing all these components together in the way it's going to come? Yeah. So, um, yeah, for, for the theater, it is going to be the standard, absolutely. I, I think. That's a good point, and but then manufacturers will need to to change their thought process at the minute because a lot of manufacturers are saying, well, you need to have six displays on to get terminals yeah. or whatever it may be. Well, in the future, if you're going to have a situation where actually you can reduce the size of your showroom to, to make it more cost viable anyway, you can have a better experience because you've got four Ds. You don't need to have three displays on four displays of this brand, this brand, this brand, because they're forcing you to have X to you. It's all about, all we're actually interested in is selling the product. Mm. You know, all, they, all the brand really wants is for you to sell their product. So to me, surely that, that will need to change in the industry to, before that can really take hold. And you know, if you could reduce the size of a showroom from having 20 displays as a huge cost and uptake mm. to, to three, one from each brand you display, you work with. There's, there's a comment that absolutely every retailer would agree with, and that's is if it's not on display, it's harder to sell. Yeah. And the fact is, you can doesn't matter how large your showroom is, you can never display everything. Yeah. So um, virtual worlds, 4D, <coughs> 4D theater, has been created to complement the showroom. It's not there to replace the displays, it's there to complement them. So in an example of, let's say you've got a, a kitchen showroom with four displays in there, we're recommending that you remove one of them, mm-hmm. install 4D theater as a digital display, yep. People can touch and feel the physical displays, then experience those same displays in virtual reality and see the ranges change, the finishes, worktops, and really get an idea that, wow, this is so similar to the kitchen that I've just experienced, the physical one in the kitchen. And they understand that the same is true of their future kitchen. What they're experiencing in 4D theatre is going to be an accurate representation of what the kitchen's going to be. But in 4D theatre, you've got the benefit of um, informed decision making. That's where you can see the worktop colors change, the door fronts finish, appliances change, and you're making a decision based on what you can see works best for you. Definitely, yeah, that's good. It, and it's all, yeah, all about peace of mind for the customer. Yeah, and uh, the the point is that this technology that we're using for the 4D, it's not industry specifically developed technology. You know, it's a it's it's a universal piece of technology that you know. Get the, the different games consoles are going to be utilising and loads of other industries have as well and I think that generally means that it is on social media and it, everyone does know about virtual reality and that means that the end consumer's expectations are already raised, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that this, this stuff is out there and, and to to see that somebody offers that and it's a unique experience, it, it's, um, you know, something that, that everybody basically will will need to get on board with this. It's it's the same as when computers first came about and, you know, there's that, that famous thing that everyone said they'd only last, was it a, a year or two, they said, and the computers won't be a thing, you know, and now mm. look where we are. It's the same with, with all the technology growth that we have. Is, is it the way that the world is going to develop means that people will 
you know, certainly have to be much more open to the idea of these things. And so it is an experience as well, yeah. putting the headset on. You, you have to experience yep. it. Watching someone else do it is not is not good enough. Yeah. You actually, you have to you have to try it yourself. Because so I you know I was I was one of the doubters at first. I was one of the people saying, "Oh, it's a gimmick! It's a gimmick! It's it's not gonna it's not gonna go anywhere." And then I actually tried it, and you see the you see the range change in front of your eyes, and you know the yeah you, you see the surfaces change, the the doors change. It's just it's, it's so powerful to, mm. to see and that as a, a presenter of, of that demonstration if you like you can see the person that's in virtual reality change as well you know you can see yeah. a you can see their, their change before they go in and while they're there and then afterwards but also the the comments they make i mean these guys you've done a lot more of the presentations and that with it but some of the comments they make is they're already in uh, in a buying mode they're already in the mode of uh, and then naturally saying well i don't like don't like that finish or that doesn't seem like it's the right height um you know and they 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 don't need to try and envisage anything it's there in front of them and they just feel natural there so. yeah, it's, it's fascinating if you look at the storyboard of how um, 4d theaters changed so in 2015 when we launched 4d so we've got two different offers out there um, we had 4d theater in mind for the future but the technology wasn't there and it would have been irresponsible for us even if it was to try and get showrooms to rip out displays and put in 4d theater um, you know, without it actually having been proven in the marketplace. Yep. So um, when we look at video footage of our development for 4D theatre, we've got so much that we just can't show anymore. And it's been a series of coming up with an idea, trialling something out, I think this is absolutely fantastic, and then really looking at it and going like, how can we make this better? So we had, uh, uh, originally we had customers being put straight into their bathroom, straight into their kitchen, and we realised that this does need to be more theatre. There needs to be this opening intro sequence, which is kind of programming the person's mind to be in the spying mode. So there's psychology involved in all this as well. Subtle things that are being communicated and the experience that they're, that they're gaining. And actually, this is something that we're um, looking more into. It's the neuroscience, the psychology, um, the benefits that VR um, are, are delivering with all this. So yeah. it's, it's quite a science, actually. And with 4D theatre, one of the first things that we did early on was want to get rid of these controllers. You know, to be in VR and you've got yeah. controllers in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're speaking about gloves. And I said, I don't want any gloves because it's the hygiene thing and different sizes and charging them up. So um, we, we're merging two different technologies together. So we've got proper hand tracking where it's using the heat signal of your hands. Yep, um, and it you know just by having hands in the room, you're simplifying the operation. Yep. Um, it's more natural, and we have people now. They speak about the experience. They say, "Oh, it's absolutely fantastic! I was inside my kitchen. I can touch and feel it." We've got loads of comments like yeah. that where yeah. we think, "Well, you weren't able to feel anything," mm. but they they yeah, have yeah. a sense as if yeah, that they have. Yeah, well, your brain's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. So we've done some early research, and we've we've trialled haptics where yep. you put sensors on the fingers. Um, we've put that to, we've put that on hold just now because we're actually finding that the sensation was more distracting than it was adding to the experience. Yep. People's imagination of having touched things was stronger than mm. a signal being sent to the finger where you're actually touching a top, but then your hand can go through it. Yep. So. Oh. Um, Sometimes less is more. Yeah. Let your brain have the imagination. Yeah. Cool. Um, so just, um, obviously we talked a lot about the 4D theatre and how it can, can work. And, and one of the things that, that I felt was a sales tool, that the 4D theatre can actually help and uh, upsell and increase the value, the basket value, as I would call yeah. it, on a, from an online perspective. But, you know, showrooms have always struggled to sell tiles to a certain degree, accessories, the yeah. whole package. Um, so for me, the 4D theatre... You, it is an excellent sales tool, and we talked about on the, with the other guys earlier, the good, better, best. So if the consumer's got a good idea in their head of what they want, you can quickly flick them to a better, best to upsell. Yeah. Uh, it's very you powerful. Know, it, it's, it's very powerful. You know, you, know, you spend an extra £1,000 and you can get this. Oh, you know, I like that workshop a lot. Or that's, that's really what I wanted. But and, and as a salesman, you probably knew that earlier, but they were being a bit more conservative. Mm. And when you show someone that... That's more powerful than telling anyone that this worktop's going to look. All the yeah. tiles, I want the beige tiles where they're an extra £40 a square yeah. metre or whatever. When you show it in the kitchen, 
oh yeah, do you know what? That makes such a difference. Yeah. I want to spend, you know, we'll sacrifice the holiday this year because we're now yeah. going to go and get the 40 Spending that bit more money now will give you years of pleasure day in, day out. So it's, so it's even more powerful when you give it to them <coughs> and then you take it away again to show them back yeah. to what the budget's allowing for. Yeah. Yep. And and that's a before and after thing. Yeah, isn't it? Mm, definitely. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a guy, um, Richard Shotton, who's a he does a lot about a lot of psychology, and, and he wrote a book called The Choice Factory. And in that book, he covers lots of different subjects, but a lot of it dates back to sort of like you know, research from a hundred years ago plus, where they were doing a lot of psychology uh, experiments. Mm. And and one of the big powerful ones, which we all know about, but we very rarely seem to use in business, is the, is the middle, uh, going for the middle product. Uh, and it shows a big science study about you know if you actually move the goalpost of that middle product one level up, yeah. what you actually end up doing is you actually up, you, know, you increase the, the value of that product. So if it was normal, the middle one was a pound, move it up a stage to a two pound one, and you'll actually find that'll make a big difference. And I think that's where 4D theater and 4D and augmented reality in the future and these sort of things can really make a big, powerful impact because now for a physical showroom and online, which I'll cover in a second, could really upsell their products mm. you know, big time. If you allow the customer to experience a higher priced option, you're actually in an environment where you can have a proper solid discussion about the benefits of it. Um, if you're pointing to something in the showroom or in a brochure which is disconnected from the design, it's, it's not as easy. So, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no emotional attachment. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? And that's that emotion is, yeah. is and a big reality thing. to it. Yeah, and it, we see this all the time. You, um, we've, we've been very lucky in that from the start um, because because of what we're doing, we've had a lot of invitations to go to things like uh, exhibitions and opening events and things, and, and add something to um, uh, to people's offering and, and get people onto the stands or to come along and and, uh, and experience these things. And what it's given us is a huge um, insight into what end consumers want. Mm -hmm. um, because we supply to the industry, you can be d a little bit detached from those guys, but they're ultimately the ones that we need to be talking to and it's it's really helped of our understanding of that thought process and when you watch someone inside their kitchen or bathroom um, having it presented to them for the first time they've sort of gone through all of the emotions which is you know um, expectation and anticipation and then the the design is well is drawn around them and becomes real they then get to explore and you just see them fall in love with mm their new room and their new home. And it's such a powerful thing. And s seeing them start to laugh and giggle and chuckle and... That, uh, that's really rewarding for us. Yeah. So when we're doing presentations and we're getting that result, we know that our customers who sell and present and sell bathrooms and kitchens in 4D theatre will be getting the same thing. There's one thing that's common. Uh, you can't see their eyes when they've got the headset on, but they're all wearing a big yeah, smile. smile and yeah. And they're really <coughs> exclaiming their excitement and wonder at, at it all. So that will buoy up the salesperson to feel more, uh, just enjoying their job more. And, and a positive salesperson is going to get a better result as well. So it, it sort of feeds off itself. It'd be interesting to know if you've got any uh, stats. I'm sure you'll get them in the future. Yeah. But but over yeah. the fact of like you know someone installing 4D return on investment, yeah. I'm sure you have a return yeah. on investment to how much that is, and also the customer experience on the after sales. And, and I, it's, that's one thing that I felt was a, a, was a good feature because when it was designing bathrooms consumers would give you their idea you may have I used the original so I used the original virtual worlds do a, a, a 3d plan show it to them etc and then you take that a bit further when they get there and it's all installed and it's working is there and there's something that's not as they expected mm. kitchen's probably more to the point where do you know what I had the bin thing here what a silly, I, why did I go for the bin thing mm. here yeah you know because they, actually I didn't want that yeah. I, I went for it because it's not what when they can experience it you've now taken that away and as you said earlier I, I don't know that people will only purchase one I think as we go uh, as, as people are more and more into their things in life and they want to spend money on things for their environment at home. I think we'll, we'll see that that time of people buying a kitchen every 12, 15 years. I think that will come down to maybe every six. I, I think in the future, I think it will. I think it's already started to come down, but I think yeah. it will definitely come down because fashion's changing. We're into fashion, so we're ripping it out to put a new one in. But you know, people's expectation of it. But I've been to this show and they did me a really good job. But you know what? I'm frustrated with these things that weren't there before. And now with 4D, you can take that. Yeah, so we, we eliminate that. We turn it to a positive where people are experiencing their installed kitchen and they're going, I'm so glad I made the change to this. Yeah. I'm glad I went with this option. So they're really 
um, yeah, positive about the decisions that they've made because they've seen the options. Yeah. In, and if you're going to make any mistakes, make it in virtual reality, mm. uh, not in the real world. It's more expensive to yeah. change in reality, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Changing yeah. kitchen years. Yeah. Um, and just going to go over to Murray then for, for a minute on, for, from like the, you've seen the, just mm. the technical side of it mm. um, a little bit. You know, where, where do you see the challenges? Obviously, we talk technology keeping up with us a little bit, but from a, I still can't work out how you guys get, we talked about it earlier, how we can get a toilet from a catalogue into the, the, the full you know, 4D theatre or augmented reality on a page. But the challenges in, in the industry, what, what do you see? And how are you going to overcome and what's going to come next? Well, um, a lot of the challenges, I think, are just getting people to actually put the headset on. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of people out there, you know, okay, maybe gamers and stuff, they're all into the, the VR, but most people coming into a, um, yeah, somewhere off the street looking for a new kitchen or bathroom they've, they'll never have tried a headset on they'll never have, have actually seen seen it in action they'll never they won't know the the power and you know what it what it gives them and it's just that yeah once we can that's the first hurdle for me is is really kind of you know spreading the word that this is a, a great thing and that you don't have to feel awkward putting your headset on because I think a lot of people feel quite embarrassed about it. Because I think that they look, you know. Well, they, people, they can't see the people looking at them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the scary bit. Yeah. You know, well, now we can see each other. Well, I'm yeah. so I can't see what you yeah, guys are doing. It. And I think uh, that is a, that's, a, that's a real hurdle. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, on, on that point, so that comes down to us as a company to train the showrooms how to present in 4D. And, you know, we, we learned pretty early on that look this isn't just a bit of software that you can sell and distribute and, and it's people just going to turn up to a training day and learn technically how to use this um, there's extra training required on how to present um, and it's, it's a, it is a game changer you're no longer sitting down at a computer doing a consultation to a customer where it's the design of feeding information to the customer um, they're being invited to step into the, the kitchen so, as we found from reviewing some um, retailers, they were still re reverting back to how they've always presented. They were doing it on the computer to then ask, well, do you want to put the headset on and see it in, in 4D? It's completely mental. Well, for us it is. Yeah. I can understand why the retailers are still doing it. It's their comfort zone. It's, it's hanging on to the end of the pool. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to let them take that brave step and have the tools and the capability and confidence to leave the computer out of the scene. We're pushing the computer out of sight, out of mind, so it's not required in the presentation at all. So the difference is you're inviting people into the showroom excited, telling them about how, what pleasure you've had in working on the project, and the simple question isn't, would you like to put the headset on? It is as simple as, would you like to see your bathroom? You'd like to see your Go kitchen. And experience your the answer is going to be yes. Yeah. Come step this way and we'll just put it on. Now, um, against what people think, virtual reality putting the headset on, it's it, it's got no age barrier. We have some customers saying, oh well, my customers are all sort of sixty plus. They're not going to want to put the headset on. Whereas Everyone's customers are 60 plus. <laughs> They're who buys. It, it was amazing, as you say. I was at a show, uh, a marketing internet e commerce show um, last year, and there was, uh, if you've seen them, but it was, there's a lot of um, 4D gaming, and there was a, a, like a dish you experience being on like a, mm. a bobsleigh type scenario. Right. Yeah. And there was this guy, he was he was had two canes, he was definitely sort of in his 70s. Probably the same one. And, yeah. and he yeah. got on it and, lay, and <laughs> sat on it. And the, the joy I've had to have got a video on my yeah. phone. The joy of him sat on there, yeah. and he was going around. He's moving. He's making. He's like, whoa! He's like moving around. It was hilarious. But, um, but he experienced it, and, and he loved it. He got off and absolutely loved it. Yeah. So. We've had ninety-year-olds walking <laughs> through kitchens very confidently. Yeah. Um, yeah, all all ages, they love it. And when you think about it, what is an older person going to understand best? Sat down at a computer being told what their kitchen bathroom is going to look like and trying to imagine things. They're probably not even clearly understanding what's being shown on the screen compared to being in an environment that they're familiar with. And that's being inside a bathroom, being in a kitchen. Everyone understands that. Yeah. And the thing that, 
you know, these these objections tend to come from retailers rather than from consumers. The barrier is the retailer. The yeah. barrier is the retailer. Yeah. So the retailer will say to us, my customers are of this age. My customers yeah. have mm-hmm. beautiful hairstyles. They won't put this headset on. They, Makeup. they're, Makeup, they're yeah. you know, these are all things. Whereas you, you talk to an end consumer, and like Nathan said, you know, it, the age is completely immaterial. I've had people say to me, I've got vertigo. Would you mind holding my arm while I walk around with the headset on? They want to do this that because lady, they want to understand their <laughs> That lady does have room. a special sort of spot for you, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> got, I've got away with certain <laughs> generations. <laughs> just, just talking about barriers and retailers, and we'll move on away from the 4D just for a second, but, yeah. but, but, oh, but we'll put you back on it quite quickly. But um, barriers and retailers are... They're, they're, they're subjects of like people who've always done what they've always wanted to do, and they've yeah. always done it this way. And I think that's the failure of the high street, as we mentioned earlier. And and I I actually see a value in in the online um, and the 4D for online. Mm-hmm. So it, just hear me out on my craziness okay. here, but you know you come to a, an online store, a bathroom showroom, it's a brochure site, uh, and then you can basically go on there. You can look around a brochure, and it's like you know upload your plan. Um, and you can get a, a design done. So we design the bathroom and we send it to you and you look at it and you go, great, that's great. But what's wrong with us sending you, you know, today the um, cardboard, Google Cardboard box with a, with a HTC system in it and you can have a 4D walk around in your own home. Mm. You know, so we send it in the post to you, you, you look it around, if you like it, you get to keep it or whatever, and you send it back. And you take that a step further and you can go, well, do you know what? Do you want to design a bathroom? And you say, so it's not me designing it or you designing it and you guys designing it, it's a name. So you turn around and say, do you, know what? Do you want a bathroom designed by Kelly Hoppen, for instance, as an example? And then what you then do is you say, you get Kelly Hoppen, not her physically designed, a team of designers, but she signs off the designs or whatever, but you pay a premium for that. You know, and then what you've then got is you've got, hey, do you know what? My bathroom is designed or kitchen was designed by X designer. Um, and I see that as, a f- as an option in the future. And then if a retailer was to do that quite well, and they had a, a series of showrooms, you could even mix the two. So you get your bathroom, you upload it, because you're doing your research, you upload it on a, a fag packet, as we mentioned earlier, to online. <coughs> they then design it, they send it to you, approve your initial design. Then you may then go to a 4D theatre somewhere in the country where you can drop in, and then you can go and yeah. have a walk around your own bathroom in that 4D yeah, theatre. Yeah. And that's where you Got mentioned... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but this is a, a future, and, and you can, you know... It's an idea, but someone might do it, someone might not. It may be too expensive to get yeah. over the line. But the concept is is the fact that I think it can have both sides of the coin. And, you know, a lot of manufacturers now are, are doing their own showrooms. So there's no reason why we online couldn't design an Idle Standard one. And you go to the 4D theatre at the Idle Standard showroom in London, Birmingham, Manchester, and you des- I mean, they, they load it up and they just look at it around. Yeah, it's great. Sign off, pay the money, off you go. Yeah. Just ideas, but... How do you see that concept um, well, of the two? Every th- good, good concepts. I mean, we don't know what the future no. is going to bring. So what we're targeted to do is to make showroom successful. And we're very pro the showroom, pro mm. the designer as well. Yep. And designing kitchens and bathrooms, you're creating new lifestyles for people. So it needs a personal touch. So you can't just design a bathroom or a kitchen. You need to get into your customer's head and find out what are the drivers for this change? Why do you why are you looking for a new kitchen, new bathroom? You know, there might be, for example, somebody that's looking to renovate a home to sell it and make money, their taste shouldn't even come into it. No. This should be the designer researching the street value there. Yep. And, and what's fashionable yeah, today? Yeah, so what's going to help yeah, value yeah, itself? That's it. Um, compared to someone who's got a new baby or aging parents moving in, or, you know, whatever the change is. Mm-hmm. So... That needs investigation. That needs somebody to ask some questions yep. and to understand and ask questions that a customer's probably not going to expect to be asked. That's really showing interest in the customer. Mm-hmm. So that comes, for me, that, that's a person who needs to do that. I mean, artificial intelligence, I mean, at some stage in the future, it might get that mm-hmm. good, but it's going to be a very long, long mm-hmm. time. It's going to yeah. be that personal touch. So the technologies that we develop... Um, it's the you know it's tool evolution, so virtual as we see it as the evolution of the pen, mm-hmm. we're to be in the hands of a professional yep. who's using the tool to create the designs to, yeah. So that's why we're focused on the yeah. showroom and the designer. Perfect, and then and then augmented reality is something that's that's coming 
it's been out for a little while, but it's really coming to fruition with some of the updates that the likes of Apple have done to the to the, the engine in the background, mm -hmm. making it more realistic and making it have fixed points so it actually works. If that makes yep. sense. Um, so where you, uh, that's a that's a modern way of doing a brochure, in my opinion. But what's your yeah take? exactly? I think there's two for for the benefit of listeners who don't know you. There's two distinct um, forms of technology at this point in time, and they may well merge in the future mm -hmm. a lot more readily and um, there may become other avenues for seeing these things but at the moment virtual reality is when you create something that is completely um, the, the entire environment is virtual so everything you see is is fictional or made up or you know a, a yeah. virtual the real world has idea. nothing yeah. to offer yeah at all. whereas augmented reality so AR is when you are um, bringing things into the real world to enhance it so you can see the real world around you but then you choose to to bring in other things and that in a game environment might be zombies coming out of walls <laughs> breaking things apart yep. in um, the KBB industry it might be <laughs> picking um, products to try out at home mm. and like you say maybe from a virtual brochure or a website so you are saying I like this product I would like to see what it looks like in, in my world mm. um, and that is for us, that's, that's a really obvious way of, for the brochure side, bringing the brochure to life and saying, I've, I can see it on the page, but I'd like to see it in front of me. And um, that might be a customer sitting at home with the brochure on the coffee table still using a paper brochure. It might be from a website, browsing on the iPad and, and seeing it that way. Or it might be from a whole virtual brochure experience that they're going through a journey and then making their selections based on what they've seen. It could also, though, be in the showroom. So it could be that in the showroom, you are walking around and you're looking at the fixed displays and you want to say, for, well, I can use AR because I want to see that same um, furniture unit, but I might want to see it in the 1200 rather than the 800. I might want to see it in um, black and gold rather than uh, the white gloss that's, that's there as standard. So the really cool. you might want to move on to another display and see how it looks beside exactly. The, the you might want to try that tap on that so. furniture yeah. unit and so on. Yeah. And, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier: is that the showroom could be limitless without yeah. having to have all the um, options. Yeah, we want to make the showrooms into super versatile digital spaces as well, yeah. where you're blending, um, you know, real product with virtual product. Mm. The, the two work really well together. Yeah. A lot of people have done that already in, in different industries. IKEA, obviously, is probably a big famous one yes. who's done it, who's invested you know, probably millions of pounds in yeah. changing their catalogue into augmented reality. Mm. That works really well for things like lamps and table lamps and tables and chairs and bringing it into your lounge. You know, paint companies like Dulux uh, have done the same sort of scenario mm -hmm. with uh, painting the walls, you know, changing to pink, grey, yellow, green, whatever. You can do that. And I, I think that's going to change dramatically in people's homes with furnishings, curtains, whatever in the future. So the big, big difference between us and IKEA when it comes to an augmented reality app is IKEA have their range. Yes. So they've got an in-app <coughs> way of browsing for product. Yep. This is a consumer app. It needs to be very simple to use. With virtual worlds, we've got hundreds of companies with some of them with 30,000 products. Yeah. Now, an end consumer is not going to browse through or know what they're going to want in a in a in catalog app. No. So with our augmented reality, the first development is very, very different to anything else that's out there. It's based, you know, if we're talking about um, choosing manufacturer's product, the nicest way for a consumer to decide on a brand that they've got is usually if they, they do have a catalogue in their hand yep. in today's terms. And so they've already chosen the brand, so that, that's one nice pick. Mm -hmm. They're flicking through the pages, reading up, buying into what products they're going to have. And then it's just a case of scanning that page and trying the furniture in their room. Yep. So it's a beautiful way of navigating <laughs> um, product selection. Mm. Um, and the great thing there, um, and this is the whole thinking behind it, is, um, simplicity of use. But it's right now is problem solving. So a manufacturer's these brochures, spends a fortune producing them. What happens to them? They've got no idea how they're working for them in the real world. Yep. So now we're making these brochures trackable, where we can count, like a website, how many hits is it getting, yep. which page is the most popular, and what product is getting the most attention in the marketplace. Mm. And yeah. for the end consumer, it's that peace of mind. Does it fit? 
yeah. it's, it's a great example. Yeah. We we demoed it in my office. Um, did you? You demoed, yeah. it, didn't you? you demoed it to me. Uh, and we um, we put a bath in the office and we put a, a unit in there and tapped the unit and the drawers open. Mm. And they're real world practical problems that a consumer will have at home if yeah. they are of the kind who's not necessarily going to go to a showroom and have the whole thing designed because they're going to sell it, sell the property or whatever it may be. Um, and there's sometimes if the, if the drawer opens, is it going to hit the shower door? Is it going to hit the door? Is it, can we open the door yeah. still? And you can do that with the augmented reality, and that's what I felt was a was a good thing for us as a business as well to, mm. to have Excellent. that option for a consumer to stick it in their room and go, Joe, you know yeah, that will fit, mm. you know, because that sometimes they don't understand. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, and then smart home in the future, uh, something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, again, you know, wh where do where do you guys? We talked a little bit on the previous group, but where do you guys see the the race with Alexa, Google, and uh, and uh, Apple? Um. Do we all use? Have we? No, I've got Alexa. Yeah. I've got Alexa and I use Alexa, Siri. Yeah. Siri. I've got my phone. Yeah, I'm on there. Yeah. Yeah. Siri as well. Nothing. So yeah, Alexa. I've got Alexa. Alexa yeah. Still feel a little bit embarrassed sometimes speaking to my computer, <laughs> which I generally don't do in an open office. That's because you always put on that silly voice. And even <laughs> <laughs> your posh voice. Yeah, it's yeah. posh. Excuse me. Come do you mind? Computer. <laughs> computer. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the phone. But the fact is, when you do. You get a much quicker, more effective yeah. result because mm. it's just so easy, isn't it? You yeah. just I think that's what you the thing. Want. It's, it's ease of use, isn't it? It's so you, good. You don't have to think about no. it. You just sell, sell it to me now. Come on. It, it, it's somebody like, doesn't have uh, anything well, you want. You just ask for it. It's there. like me Web asking page, you, bit of information, <laughs> buy something. Yeah, it's like me asking how to get to the train station. I could ask you that yeah. while I'm wandering around making a cup of tea. I don't have to stop what I'm doing to go how and do something. How much tea do you make? Is that all you're doing? <laughs> but it's like, it's just funny little things that we're all um, creatures of habit, and the most the most popular use of Alexa is about setting a timer. So that's a uh, okay. little bit of stats, and the most popular phrase is a please set a timer for X. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of the stuff today that it's being used for is functional things, like mm. turning your lights on, turning your lights off, and that. And a lot of people are doing a lot of spending a lot of time in understanding what consumers are actually going to use it for, mm. and train times, weather, news updates, those sort of things today are quite interesting. But you know. Are you going to say, please send me my chips from the fish and chip shop or whatever? Uh, that's really. all confidence, that yeah. is. You know, it's steps, it's baby steps, isn't it? And if you, if you initially, you like the idea of the technology, but you will probably only start to ask the functional tasks of it to begin with. But then as you get more confident, you do start to elaborate and you start to do things. Um, that are a little more complicated just because you get used to the, the medium, don't you? Yeah. I've got one start my day, so it fades the lights up, plays the news feed, tells me how long it's going to take me to get to work, and tells me what the weather is. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, and, and it also tells me to have a great day. And, and that's quite <laughs> useful, though, isn't it? It's, it's actually quite useful because that's some of the functionality you may have done in the past on your phone. Yeah. You get up in the morning, we're all yeah. unfortunately really stuck to our phones nowadays, uh, and you know you get up in the morning, check the weather to see what's going on, sit, check your, your, your um, traffic. I mean, mine pops up automatically in the morning, uh, and you, you might see what else is going on. Well, you decide you're going to be naughty, you're going to have dinner in front of the TV on a tray. So you walk through your home and you're saying, Alexa, turn on the lounge lights. You're still walking there, mm. lounge lights come on. Um, and you tell it what you want to watch on the TV and it's ready for you. Mm. Yeah, Sit you down, away you go. So it has got it's got functional uses as well in the bathroom and kitchen from a disability point of view. Mm. I think there's, a, there's a, quite a, a big set of um, manufacturers working around the disability and using these for that sort of area. For, yeah. you know, like, please turn my shower on, set a temperature, turn the shower off, moving uh, objects around the house. Uh, things like stair lifts and things like that, does Alexa just go down, go up, whatever it may be, you know. And there's that sort of functionality. Uh, there's a lot of security functionality around it as well. So I think it's going to be. We're in very, very early stages. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. we were talking about it earlier with like um, with your your 4D theatre. You know, today the Samsung fridge, I think it is, or uh, Siemens fridge, you can basically ask it when you're at the shop, what's in the fridge, how many eggs have I got? Well, if you're in your kitchen, you can ask the same, but and you can turn the green door to a TV of actually what's yeah. inside your yeah. fridge. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, for you guys, I was asking earlier about a challenge for how you guys are going to represent that, but in the future, you know, be able to ask the headset to show you what's in the fridge, and you guys would have pre-put something in the fridge for it to yeah. show how it's going to work. And Yeah, so home automation and 4D theatre, mm -hmm. that, that's happening. Is it? Um, we've already got all the voice commands um, with virtual worlds as the wake word. But um, we'll be introducing Alexa in there, and the Google Assistant, and then connected appliances. Yep. So people will be able to, in their kitchen, experience using these smart devices in VR. Yeah. 
Amazing. That's I, a, that's I think amazing. what we've heard from the kitchen industry in particular about home automation and the smart home is that um, it's very difficult for retailers to, to sell it unless they sell it in a joined up approach. Mm. So you imagine um, all elements of um, the kitchen working together in the actual household. And if you're just trying to sell certain aspects of home automation like uh, you know a smart appliance for example it doesn't work sat on its own you have to be able to say you know this is how the whole house is going to work and if if um if a kitchen fit is coming in at this point to rip everything out he's got a perfect window of opportunity there to go and install the smart home and take everything up to a different level and, and that's it goes back you... to that budget isn't it upselling the product upselling yeah. all things you've got to think of the lighting and all the additional products it, it's a it's, a, it's an amazing tool. I think it's going to be, as like you said, I think you were spot on. Your first, one of the first things was the fact that it's going to be a stable part of every kitchen and bathroom yeah. showroom. And yeah. I think that's definitely where it's going to end up because yeah. you're going to see the value of it. As a, if you're a salesperson, if you haven't got it, you're not going to upsell the same as someone else. Well, with over 300 showrooms now using some form of uh, 4D, um, it's already an industry standard, really. Yeah. Uh, so. Right. And this is against a tide of conflicting information from competitors who publicly are saying VR is a waste of time, it's a gimmick. But well, that shows you the difference between a company that's created something because they've identified issues that need to be resolved and they've chosen a technology that best does the job. Um, that's, that's, that's the difference. It's, it's the creating, believing and having the vision and following it through. Yeah, definitely. And really seen any of the possible pitfalls. I mean, we've, we've done development, uh, a part of the mm. R&D that just didn't work, haven't we? Oh, you know, right, yeah. we, we've, we've done a lot, of, being at the forefront of all the research and development, isn't it? We, we are, we're not just saying, we're yeah. just going to do that because that obviously works. We know why things don't work at yeah. the same time we've as well they do. We've gone through so many different versions. Yeah. We've, we've controls we've, we've for done, 4D. Yes, it's pioneers, you've got nothing to yeah. copy. Now, Benchmark. bear in mind that we, re we were releasing 4D before Oculus Rift was available. Mm. So, you know, there was absolutely nothing for us to, mm. to look at. Um, maybe some ideas from sci-fi movies. Yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. that would have an influence, but basically it was a blank page thinking KBB, what would we like as a customer? What's the experience that we'd like? Um, what are the benefits of doing this? And it's changed, changed, changed. <laughs> So many times. And you're saying the standards, aren't you? And that's always a difficult thing when you're saying yeah. the standards and going down things. And like you said, you've, you've kind of like put the haptics to the side for now yeah. until either the technology changes or yeah. it's, it's required. Or people, sometimes it's just you can be too early. Yeah. You know, people aren't ready mm -hmm. for the, the look and feel of what you've got. So it's like you know, you, you advance yourself by a couple of years because people aren't quite ready with the VR yet. Yeah. And now you're just taking another sensation too far for them. And it's, yeah. that makes it scary sometimes. Yeah. So, again, that's really good. Guys, it's been excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah,